Welcome to Down Ancient Trails, the online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust off wrong forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. Prachi, can you stop sharing the screen? Okay. We'll just start in a few minutes. Yeah, just a minute. Yeah, just a minute. We'll wait a few minutes for them to start. Okay, so welcome everyone and uh, we'll just start this program in a few minutes. People are still signing in. Just a minute. Still you can see people standing. Okay, here we go. Welcome to Down Ancient Trails. The online archaeology forum of the Sharma Center for Heritage Education India. Brush the dust off wrong forgotten thoughts. Slice through time and space. Listen to stories in stone. Whispers of voices lost in time. Build bridges across worlds. Curious minds reach out to the past. And travel down ancient trails. Welcome everyone to the second day of our workshop, Bones and Beyond, Introduction to South Asia's Pleistocene Fauna. And we are delighted to have you all here with us today. And in particular, to welcome our two speakers for today, Professor Rajiv Patnaik and Dr. Advait Jukar. Yesterday, we had a very interesting uh, series of lectures and you can catch one of them on our YouTube channel. Uh, in addition to that, we have also a number of uh, outreach programs planned during this uh, workshop. So it is meant not only for the academics in the group here and those of general uh, interest in the subject, but also for children and teachers. And I would like now to welcome all of you again and I hand it over to Dr. Sate. I welcome each one of you for this uh, uh, wonderful evening with uh, excellent discourses. We have uh, this uh, six day long workshop brings to you a beautiful uh, blend of uh, um, paleontology from as rightly pointed out by Professor Sahani yesterday, mega, micro and ultra and various methods which are there in practice and how paleontology can be enriched more and more with such wonderful applications. So I think today is uh, another wonderful day when we have Dr. Advait Zuka and Dr. Patnaik speaking on the aspects which would really bring us a wonderful canvas of uh, paleontological research happening across the world. And uh, this particular uh, workshop 
is per perhaps I would say this is uh, happening perhaps for the first time where entire uh, Cenozoic, much of Cenozoic is covered, or rather I would say entire Cenozoic beautifully covered. And the complete sequence with each and every episode of uh, a geological time is being looked into from a paleontological point of view and uh, brings you a good synthesis of data. And in the end, as uh, Dr. Shanti Popos rightly pointed out, that uh, outreach program and popular archaeology and uh, for lay people, so it brings forth a wonderful uh, blend of uh, popular as well as uh, serious research that goes on in paleontology. So with this uh, brief introduction to this uh, series of talks we have today, I, on behalf of Sharma Center, Deccan College, and also from Dr. Shanti Pupu, Dr. Uh, Akhilesh and others, and myself, uh, heartily welcome each one of you. And of course, the speakers of this, this evening, Dr. Advait Zuka and Dr. Professor Patnaik. I welcome all. Thank you. What do you, Prati and Pratik? Okay. Hello, good evening everyone uh, and welcome to Bones and Beyond series. Uh, today we have with us, as Sakesar mentioned, we have Dr. Advait Jukar and Professor Patnaik with us. Uh, we are very delighted to have these speakers with us today. Dr. Advait Jukar is a Geller Denali uh, Postdoctoral Associate at Yale Institute for Biospheric Studies and Department, uh, Department of Anthropology and also a research associate at Department of Paleontology, National Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian Institution. He has completed his PhD in environmental science and policy from George Mason University under the guidance of Dr. Mark Uhen and Dr. Kate Lyons. His research interests are microecological patterns of body size through the time, megafaunal extinctions, mammalian taxonomy and biogeography, conservation ecology, science policy, and science education and communi communication. He has received many research fellowships and he has been a deep time uh, Peter Buck fellow at the National Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian Institution. He has published uh, uh, so many articles and all of his data is available on our Sharma Center website. You can visit it and have a look at it. Today, Dr. Zucker will be speaking on the assembly of South Asia's mammalian fauna. And uh, I request our audience not to record the talk and please do not take any screenshots. And over to you, Advait Zucker. Welcome. Welcome, Advait. Uh, for all those who are participating, the talks will be there on YouTube. So if, even if you get to miss something or you want to catch up on something more, it will be available. Over to you and welcome again. Uh, Advait, okay, just a second. I will unmute you. Just one second, hold on. Yeah, right. Yes, there you go. All right, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me share my presentation. Yes, that's fine. Great. Uh, can everyone see this? Can everyone hear me? Yes, very good. Clear. Thank you. Over to you. Awesome. Uh, all right. So, uh, good morning, good evening. Uh, I'm in New Haven, Connecticut, which means it's morning for me, but I'm but everyone in India, it's evening. So thank you for uh, uh, coming uh, this, this evening. I'm going to be talking about the assembly of South Asia's large mammal fauna. Uh, I'm a postdoc at Yale, uh, and I was a former postdoc at, at the Smithsonian, and most of my research involved uh, fauna from South Asia. So the Indian subcontinent today preserves this incredibly diverse assemblage of mammals, including some of the largest mammals alive on the planet today on land, including things like elephants, large bu buffalo, gaur, rhino, and deer, as one of the only places where we have this diverse assemblage left. 
But all of these animals didn't just disappear out of nowhere. Uh, they came to India through a series of, of uh, different ecological events called immigration extinction and local evolution. And today I'm going to be talking about this, the, the story of how all of these animals ended up in the Indian subcontinent. Before I do that, I'm going to give you a short primer on space and time just to orient you on where we are. What you're seeing here is the entire Cenozoic, which is the period of time after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs over the last 66 million years on the planet. The graph here is a global climate curve, and what you should see is a general uh, cooling of the, of the planet after about 30 million years as we start seeing the onset of Antarctic uh, glaciation and gl uh, glaciations in the Arctic in the late Miocene. Continentally, by about 55 million years, India is still an island and is slowly drifting up to meet Asia. Sometime between 55 and 40 million years, India has collided with uh, Asia and the, and the Himalayas are starting to form, but the continents are still not uh, organized in the same way as we have them today. That starts to take place at the end of the Oligocene. Um, during this cooling event and all of these large inland seas called the Tethi start to close up, which promotes the formation of land uh, bridges. Once these land bridges form, that's when you start seeing a lot of faunal dispersal across the old world. And by about 10 mil mil million years, which is in the Miocene, you start seeing the continents arranged as where they are today. So I'm going to be focusing my talk on the last four million years, and just to give you a sense of, again, where we are. The world looks much like the way it looks today. Uh, down here we have the, the late uh, Pliocene, which was a warmer and, and wetter uh, period of time. Uh, and up here we have the Pleistocene, which is characterized by these fluctuating glacial and interglacial cycles that increase in intensity as we come towards the present. And all of this is caused by the formation of the northern hemisphere uh, ice sheets, changes in, in the Earth's orbit, and, and differences in CO2 levels on the planet. And all of these uh, climatic changes caused uh, dramatic changes in the local and regional environments in the Indian subcontinent, and is, is actually what was the driver for the assembly of the modern mammal fauna. And I focus on the last four million years because the lineages or the genera that we see on the subcontinent today all have their origin in the last four million years or so. So to understand this, I'm going to be talking about a couple of different ecological uh, processes. As a paleoecologist, I use these ecological uh, processes on relatively short uh, geological timescales of the order of about 500,000 to about a million years to understand how species uh, come and go, and how these uh, continental uh, bi biotas are assembled. So the first uh, process that I'm going to be talking about is immigration, which is largely caused by either a range expansion or a range shift. When a species expands its range, uh, when the uh, uh, climate changes and more favorable climates are found elsewhere. At the same time, if the climate uh, changes and the favorable climate for a species starts to shrink or contract, you can get an extirpation or a decrease in the rain size. And, and, and again, species are, are moving about the landscape because of these large-scale environmental changes. At the extreme end of, of a change in the, in the rain size is, is, is extinction, when a species completely disappears. While all of these processes are going on on slightly longer timescales over about a million years, you start seeing speciation events where, where, where new species uh, come about. And it's through a combination of all of these uh, different factors that we start seeing changes in the structure of a community through time, and that's what I, I study. And it's through these changes that we can begin to understand how uh, the modern Indian uh, fauna has assembled. Now, to look at this, I'm going to be investigating the fossil record. The fossil record in India is actually uh, pretty great. It, it goes back all the way into the Eocene, but we, we have almost continuous uh, deposition from the Oligocene onwards. However, the, the record tends to be biased towards large herbivorous mammals, animals like artiodactyls like this uh, buffalo or horses, which are odd-toed ungulates or prosodactyls, and proboscideans like this Stegodon here. 
And because the record is so biased towards these animals, I was limited in the kinds of animals I could study through time. So all of my, my analyses and, and the data that I'm gonna sh show you is gonna be focused on these three groups. This is what a assemblage of large mammals look like in the very recent past. And by recent past, I mean over the last 50,000 years or so. It's largely dominated by uh, artiodactyls, which are even-toed ungulates, animals like cattle, antelope, deer, pigs. But not that long ago, we also had hippos in India. A small proportion of, of uh, perissodactyls, only about 13%, uh, which includes things like rhinos or and and horses, and, and a small proportion of proboscideans, which includes animals like elephants. So if you have this structure of a community with the relative uh, proportions of artiodactyls to perissodactyls to group proboscideans um, in, in this uh, pattern, when did this pattern arise? And to look at this, I'm going to be looking at the fossil record to try and answer this question. So the Oligocene to Pleistocene fossil bearing rocks in the Indian subcontinent um, are found uh, actually pr pretty much everywhere. Most of the older rocks are found in parts of uh, Pakistan and in the Sivaliks of uh, uh, Pakistan, India, and Nepal, and in the Irrawaddy uh, Basin in Burma. Most of the younger rocks where we have the young quaternary fossils come from uh, peninsular India and from Sri Lanka. So this is where most of, the, of, of these animals that I study uh, come from. Like I said, India has an incredibly deep record of mammals going back almost 24 million years. And these rocks are divided up into a number of uh, formations from uh, Pakistan all the way to Nepal. My focus has always been uh, the last four million years, which, are which is found in the upper Sibaliks. Uh, it's a group of rocks um, that's typically found in, in parts of Northern India and, and uh, Pakistan. And the major collecting localities or the major fossil bearing localities in the upper Sivaliks are found in the Potwar pl uh, Plateau in uh, Pakistan between the, the Indus um, and, and, and a number of its tributaries in the Pabi Hills, in the Jammu Hills in India and the Karewa Basin in, in Kashmir. And down here near the town of uh, Chandigarh between the rivers Yamuna and, and Sutlej. And people have been uh, co uh, collecting from these uh, upper Sivalic rocks for hundreds of years. Um, and some of the collectors include uh, people who are going to talk to us uh, today, like Dr. Patnaik. Most of the rocks uh, come from uh, or, or can be divided up into three formations. Uh, Tathrot, which is the older Pliocene part of the record. Uh, Pinjor and the Boulder conglomerate, which is part of the, of the Pleistocene. These rocks uh, are largely sandstone and mudstone. They kind of look like this. This is an, an outcrop uh, near the town of Masol, but I went out there with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Patnaik a number of years ago. The fossils were initially found by a number of British explorers, uh, Hugh Falconer, Proby Cotley, Henry Marion Duran, and William Erskine Baker. And all of this was, was found when uh, the East India Company was controlling large parts of the Indian subcontinent. Cotley, uh, Baker, and Duran were all engineers in the Army of the East India Company, and Hugh Falconer was a superintendent of the Saharanpur Botanical Garden. And they just sort of had this uh, casual interest in, in geology and fossils. And they would go out in the hills and interestingly made one of the largest uh, collections of fossil vertebrates uh, ever found. Subsequently, the Geological Survey of India made a number of expeditions into the hills, uh, especially uh, in the Potwar Plateau in Pakistan, and found a number of older Miocene uh, and Pliocene uh, uh, fossils. Notably amongst them was Guy Pilgrim, uh, who actually classified the different strata um, in, the, in the rocks and divided up the, the uh, fauna and also published quite a bit on, on the various animals that were found in the Sibaliks. And subsequent to the GSI expeditions, uh, you had expeditions from the, from the, from the 
the United States, most famously Barn Brown, the man who found T-Rex, also came to India and found a number of uh, Sivalik deposits. And this was actually the, the first time that uh, the Sivaliks were systematically mapped and we actually have good locality information. Expeditions have come down from, from Yale from, from, and from Harvard since. Uh, but we also have lots of expeditions that were carried out by Indian uh, paleontologists, most notably by M.R. Sani, Dr. Ashok Sani's uh, father, and Esanullah Khan in the 1960s. Most of these fossils are now uh, kept at Punjab University in, in the Chandigarh, and there, there's been a, a lot of great literature based on these finds. And what they found was this incredible uh, assemblage. I'm only going to be talking about the artiodactyls, prosodactyls, and proboscideans here. So the fauna from the upper Sivaliks, from the, from, the, from the Pliocene all the way into the Pleistocene, includes animals like Bosacutifrons, which is this longhorned species of, of uh, cattle. You had buffalo, like, like hemiboss, gazelles, like this uh, lovely specimen of gazella, which was found in, in uh, Pakistan. You have deer, things like Cervus punjabiensis. You have antelope, like this damalops, uh, camels. You also have large pigs called uh, Culpocaris. Uh, this skull is about that big in, in size. So it was a fairly large animal. You have these incredibly strange giraffes called Sivathers, which are short-necked giraffes with large antler-like projections coming off their skulls. Uh, small hippo-like or pig-like animals called anthracotheres. This is the jaw of Mericopotamus. And you have actual hippos as well, Hexaprotodon, which is a fairly long-lived lineage of hippos in the Indian subcontinent. Coming to the Perissodactyls, you've got horses. This is Equus sivalensis, which was a zebra-like horse um, found in the Sivaliks. You also have three-toed horses, the famous Hipparionine horses, and they were fairly common in the Miocene, but they get uh, much rarer once, once you get into, into the, into the uh, Pliocene. You have a lot of large rhinos, like Rhinoceros platyrhinus, which was one of the largest rhinos ever to be found in the subcontinent. Rhinoceros sivalensis, which, are, which is, is related to the modern Indian rhino. And these strange animals called calicotheres, they, they're, they, they're related to horses and rhinos, but some of them walked on their knuckles like, like uh, gorillas and, 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 and other apes. You, uh, and of course, you've got the proboscideans. The Sivaliks are famous for their elephant uh, fossils. This is Elephas hysidricus, uh, which is a putative ancestor of the modern uh, Asian elephant. You've got Elephas planifrons and Elephas platycephalus. Uh, These are the elephantids. And you also have the giant uh, stegodons. This is the skull of stegodon Ganesha that I'm uh, studying in London. And this, this animal had 12, foot, 12 to 14 foot long tusks. It was an enormous uh, uh, creature. And the stegodons were actually fairly diverse. You have stegodon insignis, which is a strange flat-headed uh, st stegodon, stegodon bombifrons, and a, and, and a species that hasn't even been named yet. And of course, in the, in the younger part of the record, stegodon pinturensis. And you had this long-tusked uh, gonfotera called a, 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 a Nancus sivalensis. So there's great di diversity of proboscideans, of artiodactyls and prosodactyls. India back then would have looked very much like the Serengeti of, of Africa does today. And partly is because we have a lot of uh, common animals that we share with, with East Africa. Okay, so Falker and Cotley find these animals, but for the longest time, they had no idea how old they were. So, but they knew that they were younger than, than what was known as the Quaternary, so they just called them the Tertiary Sibolics. It, it wasn't until Guy Pilgrim came on that we started to see a division uh, of the Sibolics into the upper, middle, and lower. And he divided up the upper Sibolics into the three formations that I talked about, the Tathrod, Pinjor, and Boulder conglomerate. Really wasn't until um, the the 80s, 90s, and 2000s that we started to, to date the rocks. One of the problems with uh, dating the rocks on the Savalix is that we don't have a lot of typical material that we can use to date. For example, volcanic tufts can be used uh, to date using uh, 
uranium, but there's only one tuft at about two and a half million years. So what we, we do in the Savalix is use a technique called paleomagnetic uh, uh, dating. And the way this works is that you have uh, the Earth's magnetic field, which flips every so often, and that leaves a signature in magnetic minerals in the rock. And based on the patterns of the flips and based on certain index fossils, you can actually date the rocks. And this work was carried out by people like uh, Ranga Rao and Professor Nanda and teams from, from Harvard and, and Yale. And, and it's because of this that we have now have a decent dated record for a lot of the upper symbolics. Now, most of the data that I'm working on comes from the published literature. Uh, the way these data are typically organized is that you have a number of sites on the landscape. Uh, this is an example of a site from uh, Pakistan on the Mangla Samwal anticline. And these sites can then be organized on a stratigraphic uh, column, which is just a column of the rock record. And then this column of the rock record can be dated using paleomag. And then using natural breaks in the paleomagnetic time scale, you can divide up the fauna into a number of time bins. So this is exactly what I did. I collected a bunch of data uh, from the published literature, um, from sites from uh, all the way from, uh, from the Potwar Plateau in Pakistan up into India, using these dated stratigraphic uh, columns. And I came up with five uh, time periods, which stretch from the Pliocene down here into the middle Pleistocene up there. And, and there are five time bins. And I only looked at the artiodactyls, prosodactyls, and proboscideans because these are the most commonly found and better sampled of the, of the symbolic fauna. So we have a decent idea about the assembly of, of, of this part of the assemblage. Now, as a paleoecologist, I want to, uh, to understand how communities change. And the way I do this is by looking at how different individual time bins are from each other. So basically, is time in one the same as time in two, or are they different? And the degree of this difference is going to tell me about different turnover intervals. And a turnover interval just basically means an interval of change. And this change can be caused by these various ecological processes that I talked about in the, in the, in the beginning of this talk immigration, extirpation, or extinction. So it, uh, a commonly used metric is the Sorensen dice dissimilarity index, which measures overall dissimilarity, is a collection of animals uh, down here in time between three and a half and three million years. How different is it from a collection of animals found between three and, and, and two and a half? Now, differences between uh, communities or uh, uh, assemblages of, of animals can be caused by two different processes. One of them is replacement. So you have 10 species at one point in time and 10 species in the other. If those 10 species are completely different from each other, that means that all of the species in time in one have been replaced by a new set of species in time in two. That's what Simpson's beta is measuring. It's measuring how much of that change is caused by a replacement of species. At the same time, you can also have differences in the richness or the number of species between adjacent time bins. For example, if time in one is 10 species and time in two is five species, but all of those five species are the same species that are found in one, that means that all of the difference that was found is only caused by a loss of species. At the same time, you can have just a simple gain in species. And what Baselga's nestedness index measures is this difference in the number of species between adjacent time bins. So I did this for all successive time bins to figure out if what these turnover intervals were. And then I, I'm, I'm gonna talk about how I interpret these turnover in intervals. Okay, so this, this slide might be a little uh, complicated, so I'm gonna go over it fairly slowly. What you're seeing here in these bars is the total Sorensen dice dissimilarity index. And this index can then be divided up into Simpson's beta, which is in the light gray, and Baselga's nestedness index, which is in the dark gray. Simpson's beta, uh, again, will tell you how much replacement was taking place. Baselga's nestedness index will tell you what the difference in the number of species between ad adjacent time periods is. So when we look at time bins one and two and the change between the early Pliocene bins or the, or the two oldest bins in, in the upper symbolic record, we see that there's 
roughly an equal amount of change that's being caused by species replacement and changes in the richness of species. But this pattern is completely different from what we see between time bins two and three. So between the latest Pliocene and the earliest Pleistocene. We see that most of the difference is caused by species replacement. That means, spe that means older species are being replaced by a new group of species that are coming into the ecosystem. But not a lot of species are actually being lost or gained, per se. Now this pattern again changes in the, in the, in the Pleistocene where, where we uh, again see roughly equal uh, um, amounts of species replacement and changes in species richness. So both of these uh, processes are taking place in the Pleistocene. The biggest turnover interval though is between the late Pliocene and the, and the uh, earliest uh, Pleistocene. That means between the latest part of the Tatrot uh, fauna and the, and the earliest part of the Pinjor fauna. So how do we interpret these changes? Which one of these processes of, of immigration and extinction is actually driving this? Because the patterns can be caused by both. So to understand this, I've got a graph which shows up here the total number of species. And as you can see, there's an increase in the species in the Pliocene, and then there's a general drop in the number of species in the Pleistocene. To interpret this, we need to look at the the number of species that disappear after this time period, represented by the dark gray diamond, and the number of species that appear in the second time period. If there's a big difference, uh, that means that most of this, uh, that means that, that there is a big immigration e event taking place and new species are being added to the ecosystem here. But not a lot of species are going a, a extinct after this time period. Now, if you look at the turnover between time bins two and three, so that's between the latest Pliocene and the earliest Pleistocene, what we can see is a roughly equal number of species that go extinct and species that come in. So there is a lot of immigration taking place, but there's also a lot of extinction uh, uh, taking place after time bin two. If you go look at the turnover between time bins three and four, we see that there's a lot of extinction, but not a lot of new species coming in. This is what's causing the high degree of species richness difference. And again, the same pattern between T4 and T5. So what we now know from this analysis is that lots of species come into the ecosystem in, in the Pliocene and into the er early Pleistocene, but we see a lot of species disappear as well between the Pliocene and the Pleistocene and then in the Pleistocene itself. So all of these ecological processes are causing a reorganization of the ecosystem and the fauna there, which is eventually going to result in the assembly of the modern uh, uh, faunal uh, 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 assemblage. I also looked at the body size distribution. So this is basically the, the distribution of the weights of the different animals that we find in each of the time bins. And what this basically tells you is if there's an increase in a certain size class, and this is in a log scale, and we do this in a log scale for the, for the purposes of representation because of the way body sizes are distributed. And I can go into this in, in the Q&A if you'd like. We don't see a lot of differences from the oldest uh, uh, periods to the youngest periods, except that we see a loss of a lot of small spe uh, species. So maybe these extinctions are being caused by a loss of small, uh, uh, or, or the community change is being caused by a loss of small species. But we know that the fossil record here is notoriously incomplete. Uh, you, you oftentimes don't collect everything, and there are a number of reasons why. And the, and the way we can assess whether the trends that we see in turnover are real or not is by looking at something called a species accumulation curve. What we're basically doing here is seeing if as you increase the number of sites, as you go from site to site, are you collecting more new species? And that's what these graphs show. And once these graphs start to flatten out, that means that you aren't actually collecting any more new species as you increase the number of, the, the, the number of sites in your sample, which means that, you're, that you largely have a complete collection of the fauna that lived in that period of time. 
the two lines which are starting to uh, flatten out are from the latest Pliocene and the earliest Pleistocene. That means time in two and three are fairly well sampled. Time in one here, which is represented by this uh, thick gray line, is starting to flatten out, but not quite so. And the reason for that is because of the way the data were collected. I couldn't get individual site information for a lot of sites in the earliest part of the record. I think that um, once I get that, this line will start to flatten out. So I tend to trust the turnover between the, the Pliocene and the early Pleistocene. But if you look at these two time bins, time bins four and five, they're not really well sampled. Um, so what do you think might be causing this problem of sampling? Now, sampling can be, uh, uh, problems of uh, sampling can be caused by a number of factors. But there are about three main factors in the Sibalix. The first one is this thing called the problem of the boulder conglomerate formation. As I mentioned, there are three rock formations in the upper Sibalix. You have the Tatrod, which is in the Pliocene. You have the Pinjor, which is in the early Pleistocene, and the boulder conglomerate, which is in the, in the early to middle Pleistocene. The Tatrod and the Pinjor formations um, are composed of fairly fine grained Silstones and sandstones, and these formations were produced in environments which were conducive to fossilization. Not everything fossilizes, and you need a certain kind of environment for an animal to actually uh, fossilize in. This typically includes things like floodplains or slow flowing rivers and lakes. The boulder conglomerate, however, includes large boulders and pebbles and cobbles, and this represents a high velocity environment probably caused by an, an uplift of the, of the Himalayas. And it's in these environments that fossils don't really preserve. It's because they all get crushed up and broken up or they just don't form. And the boulder conglomerate gets laid down in, in a time transgressive manner from about 1.7 million years to 0.6 million years. What this means is that we don't see this layer at the same time everywhere in the upper Sibalix. At some uh, places, you see it at 1.7, million years. At, at, at other places, you see it at 1 million years. At, at even uh, uh, other places, you see it at 0.6. And so is this interval between 1.7 years and 0.6 million years that we just don't have rocks which will preserve fossils, which, which affects our sampling of the late early to the middle Pleistocene. The other problem here is that I only sample dated sections. Now, as I mentioned, it's very hard to date sections in the Sibalix. It's a fairly expensive en endeavor. And there are actually lots of places which are hypothesized to be between this interval, which haven't been dated yet, which means that I could not include a lot of these animals. So that's another a problem. And the third problem is that when uh, sites were described and published on, site information wasn't included, so I couldn't include any of these uh, publications because unless I know where a fossil comes from in space and time, I could not include it in an analysis of how ecosystems change through time. Because all of these, these uh, issues have caused poor sampling in the late or early to the middle Pleistocene part of the record. So that's a problem. So we can only really trust what's going on from the latest Pliocene to the earliest uh, Pleistocene. Still, it, it, it's a problem, but, but, but it, it's not too bad. And we can still work with that. So we know that this turnover is taking place, but why is this uh, turnover taking place? And what are the different kinds of animals that are coming into this, this system? If you think about Indian herbivores today, animals like elephants or buffalo or deer, most of them tend to be grazers. They, they feed on grass. You've got a few animals which, which, which uh, feed on leaves and twigs, which are called browsers, but for the most part, they're grazers. And grazers tend to occur in grassland environments, and grassland environments uh, tend to occur when you have a lot of seasonal uh, climates and when it's drier. Seasonality basically means is that you have a wet season and a dry season, and this promotes the growth of grass. So let's look at the environmental change that's uh, taking place from this period of time and let's see if we can 
uh, test a hypothesis of environmentally forced species change. What this basically means is that a species is tied to its environment. When the environment uh, changes, the species will go away. If a new environment comes in that's favorable to a different species, that species will come into the, into the, the system. So we know that there's a gradual cooling trend and we know from a record of the Indian monsoon that there's a general drop in the intensity of the Indian monsoon as we go from the Pliocene to the Pleistocene. So you're moving from a warm, wet world uh, to a cool, dry, and largely more variable world. What this does is that it causes forests to shrink and it promotes gallery of forest savannas and grasslands to spread. The way I tested this model was to look at hypsodonty. So different animals have different kinds of teeth which, which allow them to eat different kinds of vegetation. Hypsodon animals are animals with high crown teeth, like this horse here. It's got very high teeth and, and they continuously uh, come up and, and, and erupt throughout the animal's lifetime. And an animal with these high crown teeth are fairly well adapted to feeding on grasses because grass is an abrasive plant. It's counterintuitive, right? But actually grass has these small silica granules on the surface that, that will wear down the teeth of an animal. If we were to eat grass, our teeth would disappear in no time. Then you have animals with teeth somewhere in the middle. They're called mesodont and uh, very short crown teeth, animals like us, which are brachydont. Animals which are brachydont tend to be browsers, which means that they eat softer leaves and twigs. Animals which are hypsodont tend to eat uh, tougher vegetation like grass. Mesodont animals can typically eat something in between. And turns out hypsodonty is loosely correlated with precipitation uh, uh, patterns. The average hypsodonty of various herbivores around the world tends to correlate with how much rainfall occurs, which makes sense because low rainfall equals uh, drier environments, which also equals more uh, grass and grit. Grit is another important factor because when these grazing animals eat grass, they're going to pull it from close to the ground. And what's close to the ground? It's soil and grit. And when you chew up grit, it's going to wear down your teeth. So it's actually fairly advantageous for you to have high crown teeth. Now, I classified the various animals from the upper Sivalix as Hypsodon, Mesodon, and Brachydon, and I gave them uh, scores from one, two, three, where three were Hypsodon, two were Mesodon, and one were Brachydon. And just looking at the well-sampled intervals from the late uh, Pliocene to the earliest part of the Pliocene, let's look at the animals which come into the system, and let's see what their average Hypsodon is. Their average hypsodonty is 2.5. Most of these are in this brownish shade. There are a few green shaded animals that are uh, coming in, which are brachydon species. But if we look at the species which disappear or go extinct, the average hypsodonty is lower, is 1.9, suggesting that most of the animals which are coming into the system are animals which are better able to eat grass and animals which are going away or disappearing, going extinct, what have you, are animals which are not as well adapted to feeding on grass and, 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 and can't deal with a lot of grit in their diet. So what this is showing is that from the Pliocene to the early Pleistocene, you're seeing an immigration of species which are better able to feed on grass and grit, very much like modern Indian herbivores, and the extinction of, of species which can't do so well in these more open seasonal environments. Where are these animals coming from? Well, they're actually coming from all over the world. Horses, we know, evolve in North America. And this is a project that I did with some colleagues from uh, China and from Howard University and from, from Florence, where we showed that the horses that we find in India, Equus sivalensis, are actually directly related to these one-toed horses, which evolve in parts of North America, and then they come across the Bering Land Bridge and then diversify into, into Asia and Africa. The genus Elephas, hippos, and, and giraffes all disperse in from Africa, and deer all disperse in from, from Northwestern Eurasia. The endemic animals like buffalo, pigs, boselephines, like the nilgai and rhinos are the ones which are evolving locally into a number of different species. But most of the other species which typically characterize modern Indian 
communities like the elephant elephas or deer or, or horses, they're all coming from outside. And it's these climatic changes that have allowed for these dispersal events to take place. One of the biggest things to note um, in a change in the, in the community from the Pliocene to the early Pliocene is a shift in the proportion of bovids, animals like cattle, and the proportion of pigs. In the Pliocene, we see proportionally more pigs than cattle. But by the early Pleistocene, we see proportionally more cattle and antelope than pigs, which is what we're seeing in the Indian subcontinent today. We have more animals like buffalo and, and antelope and gazelle than we have animals like pigs. We only have two species of pigs in the subcontinent today. So what, what we're seeing here from the Pleistocene to the early Pleistocene is a change in the structure of, of the assemblage to one which is starting to look very much like what a modern Indian herbivore assemblage looks like. But these early Pleistocene assemblages, which look something like this, they include lots of bovids, lots of proboscideans, camels, giraffes, pigs, rhinos, look very different from assemblages that we find in the late Pleistocene, which are very much like the assemblages today. And the reason for that is because we lose a lot of lineages. We lose lineages of elephants. We lose a lot of large uh, buffalo-like uh, cattle, we lose antelope, we lose wild uh, camels, um, we lose these anthracotheres, we lose lots of different kinds of pigs, cevatheres, lineages of tragulids or mouse deer, and, 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 and I know. And this comes down to the mystery of the Middle Pleistocene. So we know that we have fairly good sampling from the late Pleistocene to the early Pleistocene. We can tell a fairly comprehensive, coherent story about what's going on with these turnovers, but we just don't have a lot of good sampling um, in the late or early, early Pleistocene through the Middle uh, Pleistocene. We just don't have a lot of dated sites and we don't have a lot of, of fossils there. So it's very hard to figure out what's going on. And it's in this period of time, between about 1.5 million years and about 100,000 years ago, that you truly see the loss of these more archaic lineages of giraffes and pigs and the arrival of more modern lineages like Paleoloxodon, which is this giant elephant. This, this one was actually found in, in uh, Kashmir and it's, it's currently kept in, in uh, Jammu and I was uh, studying this a couple of years ago. It's actually a fun uh, uh, project. And these late Pleistocene as assemblages also look kind of different because they, they do still have a, 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 a lot more large an animals in them. So what's going on in this period of time? Well, it's really hard to tell. Um, and it, it, it's an area of active research and, and something that can only be sorted out with, with more uh, expeditions into the into the, 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 the Sivalix and into peninsular in India, better uh, dating of the sites and, and, and a more refined uh, taxonomy. But we know that these late Pleistocene assemblages also don't look like assemblages that we find today. For example, we don't have hippos in India today. We don't have Paleoloxodon or Stegodon. We don't have these zebra-like horses. So what's going on there? Well, in the recent past, in the last 50,000 years, we saw an extinction of some of these large species. And these extinctions uh, tend to be restricted to some of these large animals. We lose Paleoloxodon nematicus, which was one of the largest uh, proboscideans to have ever lived. We lose Stegodon nematicus, an another large uh, proboscidean. Uh, Equus nematicus, which is a zebra-like horse. Hexaprotodon, which is this long-lived lineage of, of hippos, which was found in, in the Sivalix, finds its last stand in peninsular India. Bos nomaticus, which is the Indian auroch, gets domesticated into the modern zebu uh, cattle. And of course, as uh, Professor Sani mentioned, we also had ostriches, which go extinct. And our, our understanding the causes of this extinction is, is very uh, dif difficult, but what we know is that a lot of these environmental changes, which may have caused turnovers in the past, were probably not as important for the extinction of these animals as a, another environmental force, which is people. There's increasing evidence coming out, not just from India, but from around the world, that humans have had a disproportionate effect on the extinction of large mammals through time. Um, and I want to end with this and, and sort of uh, talk about what might happen 
in, in the future. We now have an, an assemblage of mammals that we know has assembled over the last three and a half million years. We know that environmental changes were probably uh, more important for past turnovers, but people were likely important for the makeup of the modern Indian mammal uh, community. And if we don't conserve these animals uh, like rhinos and, and elephants, we risk losing them altogether. We've already lost lots of interesting lineages from the early Pleistocene into the late uh, Pleistocene. And I think we should do all that we can to make sure that India doesn't lose any more of its, of its mammalian fauna. Uh, with that, I, I wanna thank uh, all the organizers for or organizing this great symposium. All of my uh, colleagues and mentors from George Mason, uh, Yale, and the Smithsonian for supporting me and my research, and the various collections managers um, and researchers at the NHM in London, AMNH, Wadia Institute, Punjab University, and the GSI who helped me and, and made this research uh, possible. So thank you so much. Uh, and I think we have time for questions at the end. Thank you, Advait, for the riveting talk, taking through time and ending on the very important note of conservation as well. Uh, yes, we will get back to questions at the end. There are questions uh, coming up over here and people are adding uh, them in the chat box and we'll come back to it at the end. So now uh, over to you, Pratik, and we welcome Dr. Patnaik to speak. I'll just unmute him. Just a minute, Pratik. Uh, Prachi, can you unmute uh, Dr. Patnaik? Just a second. Just a second. Yes. Prachi, okay. over uh, to you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it is my pleasure now to introduce our second speaker for today, Professor Rajiv Patnaik. Professor Patnaik is a veteran paleontologist who has contributed immensely towards the understanding of evolution of uh, Indian fossil mammals and their paleoecology, including the geological context of primate human evolution and the impact of climate change on the same. Over the years, he has adopted a multidisciplinary approach involving stabilized topes, dental microware, microstructure, cladistics, and so on, to address various issues concerning the neogene quaternary climatic conditions, mammalian ecology, diet, biogeography, chronology, and evolution. He has established a rodent-based biostratigraphy of, Shiva, of the Shivaliks and contributed significantly towards understanding the evolution of murine rodents to reconstruct pre-paleo-monsoonal uh, conditions. He was involved in the cladistic analysis of the Narmada cranium, the only hominin fossil found from India till date, showing closer relationship with the European Steinhelm specimen. Using various dating methods, he has found that the famous hominin fossils from Narmada was uh, reworked. In the Karnul cave deposits of Andhra Pradesh, he and his colleagues have noted that the disappearance of several vertebra vertebrate taxa was probably due to a very arid phase of the last glacial maximum. He and, his, he and his colleagues have discovered new hominid, hominoids or primates, ostrich-like eggshells, new pelican and darter fossils from the Shivaliks and the late Cretaceous rise from central India, and Miocene mammals from the Barepada beds of Orissa. He has done field and lab work in Egypt, the USA, Germany, France, Australia, and Japan. In 2016, he was awarded the prestigious National Geoscience Award by the Honorable President of India. And in 2019, he was elected a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences. Sir, we would uh, now request you to uh, start your lecture. And one gentle reminder to our viewers, uh, yeah, uh, that uh, please do not take any recordings or screenshots during the talk. Thank you. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Patnaik, and over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Pratik. Thank you, Shanti, for this opportunity. Uh, just let me know if uh, you can see the slides. Is it is it visible? Yes, 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 it's okay. fine. Yes, okay. sir, it's visible. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Advait's talk has made my life very easy because 
he has in fact uh, presented a lot of uh, information that uh, i was actually going to uh, present so i would be kind of rushing through those things those slides there are several slides in fact uh, uh, overlap well uh, my topic as uh, it says diet and ecology of neogen quaternary herbivorous mammals of india now what you see on your screen uh, is a, a myosin ape a very famous myosin ape called shiva pithecus and uh, what you could see is uh, uh, the teeth here uh, which are pretty pristine and i basically work on the teeth and look at their uh, the microstructure and the the, the microvia and also uh, uh, mesovia and uh, and uh, isotopes so whatever we basically eat or drink it goes into our system and while our teeth are growing they the 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 composition of the teeth or the 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 diet we eat becomes a part of of our uh, teeth uh, uh, structure and composition so uh, basically uh, i would be dwelling on how do we know what we know about ancient diet of uh, mammals and uh, where do we actually find these uh, neogene and uh, quaternary mammals uh, and how they look like most most uh, of uh, the uh, the mammals uh, advert has already shown uh, now some of the case studies i would be presenting which i did myself and uh, uh, of course with my uh, students and colleagues uh, on on elephants primates and rodents uh, in order to reconstruct their diet and ecology so uh, basically uh, we look at the teeth size shape microvia and and isotope geochemistry in order to reconstruct the diet now advert has already mentioned that hypsodonty index which is uh, uh, how uh, how uh, the high the crown is basically it it reflects uh, whether uh, a mammal is a grazer or a browser because you know uh, high crown teeth develop uh, because of uh, uh, grazing and uh, here on your screen you can see uh, uh, evolution of uh, horse where uh, all through the cenozoic early horse horse had brachydon that is low crown teeth and as we move on towards the the uh, oligocene miocene and pliocene and further into the pleistocene the hypsodonty index uh, increases so in a way uh, as uh, the community uh, evolve from being browsers to grazer the height the crown height increases so uh, this advert has already shown that hypsodonty index can be correlated with precipitation because basically precipitation would bring bring about uh, the ecological change and drier the conditions more hypsodont uh, hypsodont uh, mammals you would find uh, uh, compared to warm humid conditions where you would find forests uh, or swampy habitats so uh, there is a good correlation and people have been able to reconstruct uh, uh, precipitation based on hypsodonty uh, indices uh, from from uh, from pliocene pleistocene even uh, going back to miocene and oligocene now microvia as we all know basically uh, whatever a, a mammal uh, eats it uh, the, the diet leaves scratches or pits on, on the enamel surface now this is a, a, a this examples i have taken from um, a, a rat called golunda which is basically bush rat now you can see fine scratches these are the fine striations and coarse striations and pits small pits and large pits now uh, once uh, 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 if the diet of of, uh, of an individual is basically uh, grass then that diet because of the phytoliths or because of the sand grain attached to the grass it would leave a lot of scratches so there it is very uh, uh, it's a kind of very quantified study when one can uh, count 
uh, the number of scratches and average number of pits and one can figure out wh which uh, mammal is a grazer and which mammal is a browser so so if if the number of scratches are average number of scratches are more uh, 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 a mammal would be a grazer whereas if if the pits are more compared to scratches then then it would be grazer now when we when we develop such uh, ecological uh, conditions through time we basically look at the community not a single individual or, or or a species we look at a particular community and then we build a, a ecological uh, and a feeding ecology and then environment so uh, as we move uh, from from a closed environment to open environment you would find more mammals with uh, microvia uh, showing a lot of scratches. So this is how uh, 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 the diet is built. Now, there are limitations uh, when we, because, you know, uh, scratches and pits, they represent the last diet, basically the diet of maybe the last supper, you know, in a way. So it, it doesn't provide us the diet through the, 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 the uh, history or through the uh, life of, of the animal. So there are other ways to find out. So this is a good good uh, good uh, technique, good tool to, to find out ecology, but not the best in a way. In case we are uh, we do not have other other parameters, we, we can always uh, make use of uh, this technique and is uh, widely used. So, uh, the other very uh, commonly used technique is mesovia. So uh, when we look at the, the sharpness of, of the cusps, you look at this. So if the cusp is sharp, uh, then uh, usually uh, mammals who, who browse would have sharp cusps uh, and mammals who have, uh, who basically graze, they have blunt cusps. So there are stages of uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, grounding or stages of wearing of the cusps. And, and again, uh, there are scores given to various shapes. So people have been able to uh, reconstruct past uh, ecology based on mesovia as well as microvia. This example is from Europe where one could see how uh, the number of uh, 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 mammals with uh, sharp cusps, uh, uh, whether they, uh, how they, they change uh, if the, the landscape changes. So if it is more open landscape, you would find more mammals with blunt uh, uh, teeth. And if it is a closed habitat, you would find most mammal with sharp teeth. Uh, similarly, uh, this microvia thing, which we I have already mentioned, uh, more uh, if you have open landscape, more grass uh, area, uh, area covered by more grasslands, then you would have uh, a microvia that reflects uh, 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 scratches and that reflects the uh, diet of a grazing grazer. Now. Uh, I come to uh, the isotopes. So I've just given you a mm, brief idea that whatever uh, the diet goes inside uh, our system, while the, the tooth or the teeth grows, the, the chemical composition sort of uh, preserves, archives the, the, the uh, uh, type of diet. For instance, our, our enamel is made up of calcium phosphate. Now look at the composition. Our enamel, teeth, teeth enamel is made up of calcium uh, phosphate. That is calcium hydroxy, uh, hydroxy apatite. Now here, when we look at the carbon, carbon comes from uh, uh, the diet we are eating actually. So a lot of carbon comes from uh, the food and then oxygen, of course, from food and water. So if we can analyze this carbon and oxygen through some methods, we can very well get some idea about the diet. Now, in the atmosphere, 
there are uh, the carbon dioxide is made up of uh, of course uh, uh, there are basically three types of carbon we know isotopes uh, carbon 14 is radio isotope carbon 13 is a stable isotope and carbon 12 is also a stable isotope so we are basically dealing with stable isotopes now in the atmosphere carbon 13 is very less the amount is very very less uh, compared to carbon 12 so when a c3 plant like trees shrubs when they respire they kind of uh, consume uh, less amount of c13 compared to c4 plants which basically gulps in a lot of air it would uh, contain more c13 so what how does that help us once uh, a c3 plant uh, consumes this uh, carbon dioxide for photosynthesis the the percentage uh, or or c13 versus c12 which is basically uh, uh, read as delta c13 value which is given here which is uh, c13 by c12 of the sample divided by c13 uh, by c12 of the standard here a uh, uh, belemnite uh, cretaceous belemnite is used for the standard minus one and it is uh, represented in per mil not percent per thousand because the concentration of carbon 13 is very less so we need to take into this uh, into account now if if uh, uh, if you look at uh, c3 plants while while consuming while absorbing the carbon they would sort of uh, uh, the the concentration is fractionated so by the time it reaches uh, reaches the tree the 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 leaves would have minus 25 part per, uh, per mil uh, delta c13 value now uh, uh, a c4 grass uh, when it consumes it fractionates it by uh, uh, minus 6 uh, per mil that is by the time it it uh, it reaches the leaves uh, grass leaves it is minus 13 per, per mil on an average now mammal who consume pure c30 uh, pure uh, pure c3 the trees and shrubs would uh, be further further uh, fractionated because of uh, uh, their uh, metabolism and uh, on an average you would get uh, a pure c3 eater delta c13 value if if the the enamel is analyzed using a mass spectrometer you will get some something around minus 14 per mil and a pure c4 feeder would have uh, a value of delta c13 uh, somewhere around minus 0.5 per mil and mixed feeder mixed feeders would lie in between so uh, this the same thing can be uh, shown uh, in a graph where you have this uh, c3 plants they fall uh, in a range from from somewhere around minus 20 to minus 30 or 35 and and c4 plants they fall uh, in this very range where uh, uh, <coughs> somewhere around minus uh, 10 to minus uh, uh, here minus uh, 8 to minus uh, 18 and when this whole thing gets further fractionated by 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 uh, animal uh, metabolism and a c3 feeder the enamel would uh, would uh, have uh, these values ranging from uh, from uh, <clears throat> minus 8 to uh, minus 18 and and c4 feeder would have values around uh, one or positive so these these are the 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 values which can be 
calculated using mass spectrometry and one can get direct uh, 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 ideas about about the diet now when we look at uh, uh, overall picture uh, if if it is a savanna grassland you would expect uh, the values already i have mentioned somewhere uh, in this very range if it is a uh, uh, if it is a woodland savanna shrubland uh, the values would fall between minus 20 to somewhere around minus 25 and if it is a closed canopy uh, then the 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 leaves would have uh, uh, the values somewhere uh, between uh, 25 to uh, 35 now uh, a, a leaf as a, a uh, a mammal that lives in closed canopy will have this very range in its teeth. So, so you would expect uh, these values of delta C13 in in enamel, and uh, likewise uh, in wet and dry savannas, uh, the mammal enamel delta C13 values ranges between minus eight to minus uh, somewhere around minus 13 and and so on and so forth now this also has uh, something to do with the rainfall so uh, drier the condition the, as you can see rainfall changes as we move from uh, from uh, wetter to drier areas from from woodland from ca close canopy uh, from wooded uh, savannas to uh, grasslands. Now, uh, oxygen isotope uh, uh, behaves a bit, uh, a little differently. Uh, if we, if we just imagine that uh, uh, the seawater is uh, basically the standard, uh, uh, we take seawater as standard, and uh, here we use uh, the O18 and O16. O18 is uh, uh, because being heavier, it would uh, it would be found in places uh, where uh, where where the evaporation takes place. Uh, uh, where in the drier areas, the 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 reservoirs would have more delta O18, uh, not uh, more uh, O18. So uh, compared to O16, because if you evaporate uh, 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 the water delta O18 the heavier heavier isotope will uh, remain in the water and and the lighter isotope would get evaporated so this is how fractionation takes place as we move uh, from ocean towards uh, towards uh, highlands towards mountains uh, because of uh, precipitation more and more heavier stuff would fall down and the cloud would become lighter and lighter and lighter. So delta O18 uh, values would become more and more negative by the time they reach the higher altitude and latitudes. So wherever these, these uh, uh, water uh, fall in the form of either from uh, ice or, uh, or rainfall, and they become part of the surface water, and those that gets consumed by the mammal. Again, stable isotope delta O18 analysis would tell us whether that animal has consumed uh, or in kind, whether that animal uh, has uh, used to live in warm, humid condition or drier conditions. So uh, this is how we do. Basically, uh, we drill the enamel using uh, micro drills and uh, if the if the tooth is big enough we can take many samples and uh, uh, these samples can be taken uh, serially and uh, if you have a good idea about the growth periodicity of a tooth uh, of that very mammal then you can also get some idea about the diet and water intake uh, uh, annually or, uh, or, or in two years or month month basis also so uh, this is one way of uh, looking at the 
uh, at just serial sampling, we can one could do serial sampling and can get some idea about the uh, diet and uh, ecology. So where do neogen and quaternary mammals uh, are found? Uh, uh, Advait has already given a good idea where where these uh, all these mammals occur. So Shivalix uh, is one of the best place to find the neogen uh, stuff. And of course, we have found them, uh, some of them uh, in Gujarat. Now it's a hotbed for uh, searching for neogene uh, mammals. And uh, some have been found in the Northeast, uh, some in Baripada um, in the East and quaternary uh, uh, mammals are mostly concentrated in, in the Narmada and Son and along the Ganga Basin. So, uh, well, uh, most of the early, early Miocene localities contain all these fascinating mammals like Dinotherium and Gomphotherium and, and uh, Tragulids, uh, uh, Dorcatherium, uh, Giraffids, you know, all these uh, famous mammals from, from the Shivalix. Uh, and uh, middle Miocene, of course, you have uh, again uh, uh, a variety of uh, uh, elephants and other other mammals, such as uh, Stegolophodon and cane rats. So a variety of them, and the famous uh, Sivapithi scenes, Sivapithicus, uh, from middle to late Miocene, and Gigantopithecus or Indopithecus. Uh, that has been found in the late Miocene. And of course the hexaprotodon, it start uh, in the latest Miocene and goes on to occur till, till uh, the latest uh, Pleistocene. And anancus, rhinos, all sorts of, uh, then, then uh, anthracotheids, uh, hexaprotodon again. And uh, then in the Pliocene we have uh, 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 a lot of uh, uh, elephants like elephant planifrons and uh, of course we have hipparion in the late miocene as well as in the in the pliocene so uh, and sivatherium uh, the enigmatic uh, giraffid and camels all 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 these are now gone as advait has already explained and of course, uh, the mighty uh, Pleistocene Paleoloxodon. Now, uh, basically, I have been trying to find out what these all these mammals used to eat and what kind of ecological condition they lived in. So, uh, I would be presenting some of the case studies. Uh, so, that's a, a tooth uh, section, uh, a human tooth. Just to give you an idea at what resolution can we uh, go down to uh, look at the enamel. So, you know, enamel grows periodically. So this tooth grows. Uh, in fact, these red lines are cross striations. These are daily growth. And these blue lines are uh, striae, uh, resious lines. These are weekly growth. So uh, these weekly growth lines, they end up on the surface of the enamel. So the idea is if we can strike, we can drill, we can uh, sample these, these enamel layers, one can, uh, uh, can get very high resolution record of the diet and, and water intake. And this is uh, just to give you an idea, the Siva Pithikas I just showed you, though it is 10 million years old, still, the line, resious lines are very neatly preserved. So pristine and even daily cross striations are also preserved. So uh, one can very well extract this information. There you go, more, more daily, daily uh, cross striations. So uh, there these are. And I actually used laser ablation to uh, do sampling and Professor Serling, who is going to speak uh, in a couple of days, I, I visited his lab and there I used laser ablation to extract 
uh, micro samples from from uh, uh, from primate teeth because they are you cannot uh, you cannot afford to drill uh, drill uh, primate teeth or uh, rodent teeth so i use this uh, laser ablation and then the, these are the sample sites you can see so these and these are the perikramata so every growth line you see is basically represent one week so one can take several samples just on one on tooth and and get uh, an idea about the diet of that uh, animal that lived some 10 million years ago so in fact i counted the number of striations uh, in this very giant uh, gigantopithecus that that lived in the late miocene that this count to uh, came to 12 uh, so uh, so that that uh, cross tri those residual line uh, uh, represented 12 represented 12 days so i could actually figure out uh, how many how many days or how many months or how many weeks i have sampled so this sampling uh, showed that overall uh, this represented uh, some around almost uh, 14 months or a little more than that uh, 10 million years ago this guy used to eat only c3 this black dots are basically delta c13 so you can you can uh, figure out that it was basically an arboreal uh, mammal and it primate and used to eat only c3 diet so some fruits or, or c3 leaves but but look at the 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 water the delta delta 18 value so there is a seasonality one can see there is a shift in the delta o18 value and i try to correlate with the uh, present day season seasonality that rainfall so what what you could see that during the monsoons so this very represent one year so when you have uh, that is daily uh, new daily rainfall data today's data so when you have uh, less rainfall the delta o18 values are more positive when you have more rainfall the delta o18 values are negative so there is a correlation between this and 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 the the data i could uh, produce from just a single tooth so there is there was monsoonal type of uh, uh, climate during uh, uh, during late miocene when uh, uh, Indopithecus used to live, and of course I used uh, microvere, and I could see uh, whether these uh, primates used to eat. Uh, they were frugivore or they were uh, uh, folivore. So based on microvere, one can get that idea. But one other primate that used to live uh, with uh, uh, the, the Indopithecus was Sivaladapis, and it might have been uh, eating some very tough uh, uh, grassy diet, maybe C3 grasses. So uh, elephants also, I, uh, I uh, we try to look at, and uh, we could uh, see that early elephants were, I'll just, uh, move a little bit faster so i for that we chose uh, some of the uh, mammals from mudumalai uh, forest and uh, we looked at how the delta o, uh, c13 values and delta uh, o18 values vary uh, within a particular uh, seasonal forest among the mammals and then we applied this to the fossil mammals so we could see uh, uh, the dinotherium uh, in the uh, in the middle miocene used to be a c3 feeder and whether we could see some seasonality or not uh, these were checked using uh, delta o18 values and uh, so overall uh, when we look at the evolution or dietary evolution of elephants we see that early early elephants like like the gomphotheres dinotheres were mostly uh, c3 browsers and when the grassland uh, spread uh, uh, because of shrinking forest and uh, which might have uh, happened due to climate change 
lot of uh, uh, elephants they shifted uh, to grazing and then at some point uh, uh, when when uh, 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 mighty when the, this uh, paleoloxodon uh, migrates and some of them so like the the modern elephants uh, or or ancestor of modern elephants uh, elephas hisudricus it shifts back to forest might have been some uh, competitive uh, uh, because of competition because this uh, paleoloxodons were super grazers uh, of that time and of course uh, hypsodonty indices of uh, these uh, mammals also correlate fairly well we could see that early uh, early uh, elephants were low crown brachydont whereas late uh, elephants were most of them were hypsodont as the grassland chiefs so uh, other mammals uh, of course uh, there were all sorts of mammals associated with elephants and uh, they they uh, basically shared uh, shared the most of the area like grasslands so as uh, uh, advait has already mentioned so this was the time of uh, shifting from grassland uh, from from wooded uh, kind of condition to grasslands more and more uh, mammals now adapted to grasslands well uh, beside elephants we also did some uh, studies on on hipparion and other other mammals and civatherium which was a grazer again and rats and mice also we used laser ablation because they are very tiny and uh, they also kind of show a similar trend when we move from 14 million years to uh, pleistocene uh, there is a trend in 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 rats and mice as well early rats and mice were basically browsers and uh, later on the uh, a lot of them become grazers so overall uh, picture that is being developed uh, gradually uh, uh, which sort of uh, uh, shows us that how uh, things are things have changed over uh, the past 14 million years uh, early early primates were basically browsers used to live uh, live in the forest later primates were like like theropithecus or prosynocephalus they they were well adapted to uh, uh, grasslands and advait has very well explained this um, uh, and uh, uh, we are still developing this and uh, uh, more and more data is uh, now uh, coming from uh, the ply pleistocene and uh, and kach also uh, uh, there is good uh, amount of data uh, which would be included as we move on so basically to conclude uh, teeth uh, and the enamel is an ex excellent archive to understand diet and environment of extinct mammals as they they remain unaltered for millions of years and uh, intra-tooth variability in stable oxygen carbon isotope concentrations can provide very high, high resolution interseasonal variability in paleoclimate and paleoecological data. So I, I thank again the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you all for, uh, for, your, uh, for listening. Thank, Thank you, you sir. So, over to you, Pratik.